In a 2002 BBC poll, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was named as the greatest ever Briton. He is an incredibly popular figure in the United Kingdom for his gallant leadership of the Allies during the Second World War. Many of Churchill's speeches have been preserved as national British treasures, and his impact on the British never-say-die bulldog attitude is undisputed. While everyone remembers Churchill as the man who dared go up against Hitler, fewer people realise that he was, in fact, a proud Freemason, and drew upon his membership of the fraternity throughout his successful life. Considering his many accomplishments, it isn't easy to encapsulate Brother Churchill's remarkable life in one moment. He led England through the horror and tragedy of World War II and beyond, yet much of his story was written before he assumed his position as Prime Minister. Churchill was one of a kind, a strong personality and fearless leader who took the weight of the world upon his shoulders in its darkest hour. Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was born on November 30th, 1874, in Oxfordshire, England. His family descended from the Duke of Marlborough, residing at the top of the English aristocracy. He attended the Harrow School as a boy, quickly taking an avid interest in English and writing. At 21, he enlisted as second lieutenant in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars Cavalry Regiment, thus beginning what would become a long and storied career as a serviceman. Over the next several years, Churchill hardly stayed in one location long. He travelled to Cuba, New York, and then India. While in India, Winston served as a soldier and a journalist. He then moved to the Sudan in 1898, serving under General Kitchener in the 21st Lancers, while doubling as a journalist for the Morning Post. Although still a young man, by 1899, Winston had gained a lifetime of experience. He was only 25, but ready to begin his journey in English politics. That year, he returned to Britain and was elected into Parliament. Charming, passionate and quick-witted, Churchill enjoyed a meteoric rise in the English government. Few boasted such a strong personality, and in 1904, he crossed the aisle in the House of Commons, ditching the Conservative Party in opposition to the Aliens Bill, which aimed to deter Jewish migration into Britain. The House would prove too small, and he ascended from post to post over the next ten years. By the onset of the First World War, Churchill had foreseen a conflict with Germany. Having spent a few years leading the Admiralty, he had strengthened the British Navy in preparation for war. As the fighting began, Winston resigned his post, re-enlisted in the army, and held several positions, including the Minister of Munitions. Here he led the research and development efforts for the tank, a weapon that proved vital to deciding the outcome of the war. Unlike his predecessor, Neville Chamberlain, Churchill had viewed Hitler and the Nazis' ascent to power as a looming threat. In response to England joining the Munich Agreement with Hitler in 1938, Churchill described the move as a total and unmitigated defeat. It took only a year for Britain to be dragged into war against Germany. After the war began, Chamberlain did not last long as the Premier. Churchill, however, was now among one of the most powerful men in government. With his many years of military and government experience, few were as well positioned to lead Britain during the war. He became Prime Minister by forming an all-party government in 1940, and immediately pursued an aggressive campaign against the Nazis. As the battle for Britain raged, the world witnessed some of Churchill's finest moments as a leader, inspiring his country folk with stirring speeches over the radio. Over the next four years, the Prime Minister was essential in leading the Allies to victory against the Nazi regime. He refused to negotiate or surrender despite the long, dark hours, knowing the stakes were too high for his country. It was the most significant conflict the world had known. Yet, his bravery, charisma, and military genius were unprecedented and made him precisely the right man for what was, in the moment, 
the world's most formidable job. Several years after the war, Winston was again elected to Prime Minister in 1951. Now in his late 70s, his health began to fail, and he retired in 1955, living out his final years at home and dying in 1965. Queen Elizabeth decreed him a state funeral at St Paul's Cathedral in honour of his innumerable achievements. Indeed, it is staggering to consider his many struggles, achievements and triumphs, that one man could achieve so much and strive to live a life of integrity is exceptional. He earned a Nobel Prize for Literature and 37 orders, decorations, medals and countless honours. Churchill was initiated into Studham Lodge No. 1591 in May 1901 at the age of 26. He completed his second degree two months later and was made a Master Mason on the 5th of March 1902. It is said that Churchill was motivated to join the Lodge because he had many friends and family members who were Masons, and Freemasonry at the time was an incredibly popular and well-respected institution for men of good social standing. We can also point to Churchill's membership of other fraternities as an indication of his interest in the benefits of connecting with like-minded men in his community. In 1904, he accepted an honorary membership in the Hawthorne Lodge of the British Order of Ancient Free Gardeners. He is also recorded as a member of the Loyal Waterloo Lodge of the National Independent Order of Oddfellows, as well as a member of the Ancient Order of Druids. It is clear that Churchill's attraction to fraternal institutions likely inspired him to become a Mason. Studham Lodge itself has a storied history. For instance, the guest list of the Lodge's 21st installation banquet in 1897 included 17 members of Parliament and numerous earls, knights and lords who would have ensured the night was most spectacular. It appears no coincidence that Winston Churchill joined a lodge with such highly regarded social standing, as he probably would have believed that the connections he developed within would help him further his political career. It was only after initiation that he would have learned the true benefits that masonry has to offer. <laughs>